You want believable stories? Because today's episode is full of them. Most of these stories are the kind that don't go too far, the ones that don't jump the shark, as you will, and instead leave you creeped out by the lack of doubt you're left feeling. These are my favorite types of stories, not the ones where people claim to fistfight Bigfoot, no, the ones that leave more to your mind. This is Outdoor Terrors, the podcast where real people share their allegedly true and scary experiences from the great outdoors, and I read them to you. Enjoy today's stories, featuring disturbing cave discoveries, storm visitors, and more. If you've ever encountered something terrifying while outdoors, send your story to me at darkstories.org so I can narrate it. And check out eeriecast.com for more shows like this. Now, throw a log on the fire, because the night is still young. It wasn't a raccoon, from Red Scarecrow 99. Before I recollect this story, allow me to give some background. I've spent my whole life in the mountains of northeast Pennsylvania. I've spent considerable time in the wilds, hunting, fishing, and camping. I've been lucky to see almost all the wildlife this state has to offer, but I do believe there are many things out there that we as humans don't know about or don't understand. It was late summer 2015. My ex-wife, whom shall remain nameless here, grew up in the streets of Trenton, New Jersey. She had never had the opportunity to camp, and my family wanted to give her a taste of our rural lifestyle by arranging a quote-unquote camping trip in my parents' backyard for a weekend. It wasn't exactly roughing it, as we would be staying in a pop-up camper only 25 yards from my parents' cottage. Most of the weekend was delightful. There was plenty of fishing, hiking, swimming, and campfires, toasted marshmallows included. Just me, my family, my ex-wife, and our two lab mixes, named Yoshi and Max. We'd already spent two nights in that camper, and this was to be the last night. My father, a salt-of-the-earth kind of guy, cautioned us on an incoming rainstorm. We chuckled and went to bed, excited to sleep under a thunderstorm. The idea of the sound of the rain on the roof of the camper sounded pleasant. We said our goodnight and put the dogs to bed, shortly before turning in for the night ourselves. My now ex-wife and I talked briefly about how nice the weekend had been, before falling asleep rather quickly. We'd swam all day, and we were exhausted. I awoke sometime around midnight. It was tough to say exactly when, but it was pitch black out. The camper was softly rocking, and I could hear distant thunder rumbling. I closed my eyes, trying to go back to sleep, only to be torn from sleep again some time later by the crack of thunder that shook the camper more. My wife and I both bolted upright, and the dogs began to bark as the rain came down like bullets from the sky. We had just started to discuss our next steps when we heard it. Bare feet running down the flagstone path from the cottage to the camper. We both assumed it was my parents coming to wake us up to tell us to seek shelter in the house. We're coming, Papa Bear, my ex-wife yelled out as the dogs began to growl. Now, Yoshi is a lab Akita mix, and in his prime, he was 125 pounds. But even he ducked under the table and hid with the more skittish Max. Suddenly, something punched the camper door with enough force to rock the little pop-up. We both screamed as the camper leaned to one side, like something was pulling it down, and a loud bang came from the roof as something jumped up. It was pitch blackout, which was odd. The yard light didn't even turn on with its motion sensors. The dogs began to bark furiously as my wife began to sob. We were both terrified. In the darkness, I whispered, I'll send the dogs first, then me, then you. Run to the house for Dad, and don't stop for anything. She continued to cry, but I could barely see her nod. I flung the door open and yelled, Yoshi! Max! Go! 
they took off running at my command. I hopped out unarmed, but remembered the hatchet my father used for the campfire. It was only a few feet away. I scooped it up as my wife ran screaming. The motion-sensing lights finally came on, shining on the downpour and revealing the yard. I looked up to my horror. There was nothing there. I was greeted with only rain and wind as my father was dragged, in his undies I may add, to the back porch by my mother. Whatever had attacked the camper and jumped on top of it had vanished. The camper itself was surrounded by a small patch of trees that had no low-hanging limbs. I would have heard or seen it drop, but there was nothing. Shaken up, I went inside and told my dad and mom what happened. My dad doesn't believe in the supernatural or paranormal. I was told numerous times about large raccoons and was admonished for running away from tree rodents. But I was promised an investigation in the morning. Needless to say, only the dogs got sleep that night. At first light, we went outside. I retold my story and showed my dad how the camper was solid as I jumped up and down on it. There wasn't any sway when I did it. It couldn't have been the wind. I tried to rock it myself, and I'm six foot one, 230 pounds, rock solid, and I gave it no sway. The scariest part was when he, my dad, got the ladder to examine the roof. There above the door was four long fingerprints in the algae. See? Uh, raccoon paw prints. Dad, I said. Just look at the prints. The fingers are seven inches long. He just shook his head and went back inside. Now I know it wasn't the wind, and it wasn't a raccoon. I have no idea what paid us a visit that summer night, but I'm glad it didn't stick around. When the Ground Shakes From Yosemite Sam My wife wanted me to share this story with you. She listens to the podcast and thought I should let people know what a true, real-life, scary story was like. When I was a kid of about 12 years old, I used to live in a small town just outside Johnson City, Tennessee. That's deep in the Appalachian Mountains. This was back in the 70s, and people were different about their kids then. We would go off all day and not come home till dark. People didn't worry about the same kinds of things we do now, but perhaps we should have. We would explore the woods, find abandoned mines and caves, and camp outside on warm summer nights. We weren't stuck in front of the TV, like kids today. Back then, you could only get two or three channels in the mountains, so it was pretty boring to just stay home. In retrospect, we did some pretty dumb things and took some insane risks that could have cost us our lives. But somehow, we survived it all. The story starts early one morning when I and my brothers and sisters were waiting on the school bus. It was around 7 a.m. on a cold November morning. This would have been in 1973 or 1974. We noticed the gravel on the road moving. We heard the sound of rocks falling and we could see dirt and dust rising from a nearby ridge. This continued for about 10 seconds and was enough to make us run back into the house. The radio in my dad's old car said there was a 7.3 magnitude earthquake in Claiborne County to our north. I remember my dad saying it was felt all the way to Charlotte, North Carolina, some 100 miles south from there. We ended up missing school that day, which was pretty cool for us. So we took off, like we usually did into the woods by that ridge, because we wanted to see which rocks had fallen. On our way to the ridge, we saw a place where the ground had opened up, revealing a cave entrance. Now, real cave entrances, which aren't cleared for tourists, look a lot different than the ones in movies or pictures. This was covered with roots and leaves and dirt, but you could see inside it pretty well. We went back to the house, getting some rope and my dad's old lantern, before long, we were back at the new cave with these supplies, gathering up our courage to go in. 
We talked about finding gold or diamonds, maybe turning it into a secret hideout. There were four of us, including two twin boys, my best friend Dale, and me. Dale and I were best friends. We were inseparable for the most part. The twin boys were always getting into trouble, and they used profanity a lot, but they were always trying to outdo each other, so they were fun to hang around with. We climbed down the embankment to the mouth of the cave, and we turned on the lantern. Dale pulled away roots and leaves to make the cave mouth big enough to climb through. I stuck my head inside and was immediately met with the smell of death. The air was so thick with the smell of it, I gagged. Not to be discouraged, I pulled my t-shirt up over my nose and pushed past the roots until I was inside. Dale handed me the light, and inside I saw a low flat room about four feet high and easily twenty feet across. The cave went further back, but my light couldn't make out any details past that. Dale crawled through next, then the twins. Holding the lantern as high as I could, we proceeded into the cave. Once we were inside, we could see bones of animals all over the floor. Some of them had been picked clean, others still had meat on them. Then one of the twins found a dog collar on one of them, so it told us these were the bones of cats, dogs, sheep, deer, and small rodents. The bones were scattered around the floor, as if they'd been tossed away from the carcass in many cases. I remember thinking what could have done this when I noticed two lights reflecting the lamp in the back of the cave. It didn't make a noise. I remember saying, Guys, we need to get out of here now. I never took my eyes off the two pinpoints of light. It must have been something in my voice, because Dale perked up and followed my gaze. Without another word, we all got out of the cave as fast as we could. There was only one thing it could be, a bear's din. Once outside, we all ran way back to the house and told our dad what we saw. He was getting ready to go to work, second shift at the Blue Jean factory in town. He told us to stay away from that place until he could go check it out. Mom overheard us and told us if we went back out there, she would tear our butts up. Getting mauled by a bear is not something we wanted, so we agreed. Just to be sure, Dad gave us a few chores to keep us occupied until he got back home, splitting firewood and breaking up coal. That was enough to end our adventures that day. The rest of the week was uneventful, except for the news of the earthquake. That was the topic at school and at home for the rest of the week. By the weekend, Dale and I had decided we were going to go back and explore that cave to see if there really was a bear in it. Pretty dumb, but we decided to go armed with pocket knives and sharp sticks to take care of the bear if there really was one, or at least we thought we would. We climbed the hill back to where the cave mouth was. A couple of nighttime rains had washed away the mud and made the mouth of the cave bigger and easier to get in and out of. We made our way inside the cave and passed the smell, which was very much still permeating from the entrance. Once inside, we crouched and walked back to the back side of the cave. The cave entrance narrowed to an opening in the back wall that sloped down at a pretty steep angle like a set of steps. We continued deeper and noticed there were no bones or animal remains back in this part of the cave. It went back another hundred feet and stopped at a rather large hole that seemed to go straight down. The strangest part was that we could feel air coming up from out of the hole. It was warm air. Shining the light down into the hole, we could not see the bottom. We didn't have enough rope to go farther, so we made our way back out of the cave. Undaunted, we wanted to know how deep that hole was. We used the lantern to build a fire, and we made some makeshift torches. Dale was one of the best fire starters I'd ever seen. Within minutes, we were equipped with torches and were back in the cave. We dropped a torch down the hole. It hit the bottom about 20 feet down. It opened up into a room with a dirt-covered floor. Then, there was a growl. 
It was unlike anything I've ever heard in my life. It was coming from somewhere down in that hole, from something. It sounded like a tiger or a lion, some sort of big cat, more than that of a bear. Then it screamed so loud we dropped our gear and covered our ears. We could see from the torch lights it was circling the torch, but staying away from most of it. It was looking up at us, big and lean, definitely not a bear, more like a mountain lion, but its fur was black as pitch and its ears were like a Doberman's, straight and tall like horns. It didn't look like any cat or dog or bear. Its eyes glowed red in that firelight, like two hot coals. It would look at me, then at Dale, as if it were trying to decide who it would kill first. When it screamed again, it was like having a ton of sand dumped on you from above. I went down to my knees and tried to curl into a ball. The scream made me feel weak, unable to think or move. My head felt like it was a gong, or someone had placed a giant bell on my head and started to beat at it. I felt sick, confused, in pain, all at the same time. Dale collapsed into a ball with his hands on his ears. He had dropped the lantern, and it had rolled off the edge, down into the hole. It went pitch black up top, but the bottom of the hole burst with light as the lantern shattered right beside the thing. Another scream came from it, this time a scream like it was in pain. We didn't feel weakened from it this time. We were just terrified. It was like the spell had been broken and we were free. Our survival instincts kicked in and we took off. Dale and I made our way up the slope as fast as we could. We could tell that whatever that was in the hole was going to come after us. We just knew that it would not let us live for dropping that lantern. It was like there was a connection to the thing in our mind and it was talking to us. Once up the slope, we could see the dim light at the entrance, and we quickly made our way back. Just before we reached the mouth of the cave, we heard the scream again. This time, it was like being hit by water coming out of a fire hose. It knocked both of us down as we desperately covered our ears, then tumbled forward toward the entrance. We got out of the hole and ran all the way home with tears pouring down our faces. Neither one of us could hear for a week. I remember having a headache that was so bad, my parents took me to the emergency room. The doctor couldn't find anything wrong with us, other than the many scratches and bruises we had from the cave. We were told that we were very lucky to be alive, as there are a lot of poisonous gases in caves, and that was probably what was causing the headaches, but it should pass. About a week later, it was just a ringing sound in my ear but I will never forget it. I remember having the strangest dreams for months afterward. Dreams where I was back in that cave with that screaming thing. I would wake up curled into a ball again, just like before. I think Dale experienced the same thing. We never went back to the cave. It was very unlike us, but we weren't courageous enough to go back there. My family moved soon afterwards and Dell and I lost contact. Many years later, I went back, after hearing that they'd had another earthquake. I wanted to visit and see if that cave was still there. It is, although it looks like part of the roof collapsed in on it. I tried to look up Dale too, but he had moved away. The twins were there, working at a local garage. They said Dale lived there for about 10 more years, he never quite got over the experience. Actually, he ended up being sent away to a special school for the deaf for several years. When he did come back home, he was a very quiet person. Didn't make many friends. He lived with his parents and worked at the mill for a while. Everyone said he kept to himself and that he liked to drink. I don't know what it is that the earthquake opened up back then. I guess I'll never know. I do know this, though. It was more than just a bear, more than just a mountain lion. 
This thing had the ability to use its cry to disable its enemies or prey. I'm not sure which we were to it. I also know it was smart enough to get into our heads. I've never known another animal that can do that. Red Pants Guy from J. Ion. My foster aunt enrolled her son in a private school known for its excellent extracurricular activities. He chose to be a member of the Scouts, which required weekly outdoor task participation in order to rise through the ranks and earn their badges. One morning, the Scouts, boys and girls, were tasked with walking around a small forest, taking pictures at certain points to prove that they did complete their assigned circuit. The boys were assigned into groups of three, of the same gender, and so were the girls. The trio of boys my foster aunt's son was a part of would always be instructed to walk ahead of a trio of girls, followed by a trio of boys, and are then followed by a trio of girls, and so on. So their formation was one of alternating genders, with each trio separated by a distance of around 50 meters. The morning that they walked in this formation, he noticed a jogger who wore bright red track pants, standing near the most remote edge of the small forest, looking at them in silence. He didn't think much of the jogger in red pants, since it was commonplace for people to exercise in the woods in the morning. He figured the jogger was just looking at them out of curiosity. After completing their first round, their scoutmaster was very happy that they completed their task so quickly. He gave them the opportunity to get a few badges in one day if they could complete two more rounds along the same path. The scouts agreed, and they set off on the same way in the same formation as before. When approaching the same remote edge of woods, my foster aunt's son realized that the very same jogger with red pants was still standing in the exact same spot. He was looking at them in complete stillness and silence. His buddies also noticed the jogger this time, and they wondered if they should take a picture and tell their scoutmaster about it. However, since the area is a public place, frequented by joggers, as mentioned before, their fear of an unnecessary confrontation with this stranger had them deciding to just ignore him. When the third and final round of their excursion took them to the same spot, they kept quiet and looked at the ground to avoid the awkwardness of staring at the still completely motionless and silent jogger in the red pants. When the trio was about 30 meters away from that spot, they heard a shrill shriek from far behind them. They turned, and they saw the girl sprinting towards them in terror, mouths wide open in screams. The boys, assuming great danger, started to sprint toward their school as well. When they arrived, they ran to the scoutmaster, who demanded to know what had happened. One of the girls, pale from fright and still shaking, told the scoutmaster that as she and her friends were approaching that area at the edge of the forest, a man jumped in front of them while rigorously stroking his... member. The man had a disturbing look in his eyes and a demented grin, with those bright red track pants pulled down to his thighs. The girls were horrified at the sight and ran away as fast as they could. Then a large group of boys and girls arrived at the school's entrance, Turns out, the remainder of the formation heard the very loud shrieks, too, from those girls. So all of them ran to the spot where the screams had come from. But they did not see anyone there. They had decided to band together for safety and finish the excursion as quickly as possible. The scoutmaster called the police, who combed through the small forest and surrounding areas, for this pervert in red pants. But to no avail. After taking statements from the scouts who saw the jogger in red pants, the police deduced that it was an opportunistic sexual predator who was watching and waiting for the right time and right targets to expose himself. Since the pervert was watching them complete a couple of rounds around the forest, he was able to know that the girls were grouped together and isolated from the others, so he was able to corner them and escape before the others noticed. 
Their scout activities were supposed to end in the afternoon, but because of this case, everyone had to remain at school until late evening, so the police could do briefings on safety and set up an alert for that pervert in the area. My foster aunt's son continued in his school's scout activities until he left for college a few years later. From what he heard, that pervert in red pants was never caught, nor was he seen again in the area. However, because of the incident, all the school's outdoor excursions from then on had to be chaperoned by at least three adults, with many parents volunteering their spare time and even offering to pay for extra security at particularly crowded events. My Horrifying Horseback Riding Experience From Mrs. Ponchy John This happened when I was 19. I went out to my Uncle Buck's house for part of the summer. My Uncle Buck lives on 100 acres of land, and he has a lot of animals, ranging from dogs to horses, and even a pet deer, which he had found as a baby after the mother was poached. I decided to go horseback riding with my cousin Jake. I was riding my horse, Trent Malloy. Yeah, my horse was named after a character from Walker, Texas Ranger. Jake was on his horse, Lady B. Jake's border collie husky mix, Rory, came with us. As we're riding, we stopped, because we began to feel watched. Jake calls Rory over, and Rory jumps onto Jake's lap. We hear a twig snap to our left, so we look in that direction, and I kid you not, we see this person in a Michael Myers costume. Jake and I looked at each other, scared. Before we could say a word, Rory starts growling towards our right, and when we looked in that direction, we saw someone in a Jason Voorhees costume. At this point, Jake and I are both confused and terrified. But then the men pull out knives. We couldn't be sure if they were real or not, but we weren't taking the chance. Jake and I got the horses turned around, and we gave them the signal to run. Jake was holding onto the reins with one hand while he had his other arm around Rory. I looked behind us, and I saw those people chasing us. As we were almost back to Uncle Buck's house, we saw a knife fly right past us. Over the sound of hoofbeats, Jake yelled, What are these freaks doing? Then, gunshots broke out through the air. We were nearly back to my uncle's when we saw him running out of the house with his shotgun in hand and his neighbor Joe and his son Kyle rushing over with their baseball bats. Those people in Myers and Voorhees costumes stopped at the fence after Jake, Rory, and the horses got through it. My uncle shouted for them to get down on the ground, and they did. Jake ran inside and called the cops. When the cops came out, they took the masks off the two people and revealed two men. They told the cops they just wanted to scare someone, but the cops weren't buying that one bit. The two men were actually charged with attempted murder, and currently, they're in prison. If Rory wasn't with us that day, we probably never would have seen that other guy. And if we didn't have the horses, we would have never outrun those two maniacs. Sadly, Rory passed away a year after this of old age. It took a toll on Jake. Rory was his favorite dog. But he's doing better now. After all, he and his dad have 20 other dogs, with a litter of pups due in March but that day will always be stuck in our minds. Backwoods, Ohio Witch Encounter From C. Philly 100 This is a story I gathered from a female friend and will be told from her perspective. I had been out hiking in the backwoods of Ohio, taking a nature walk if you catch my drift. Weed was not really legal in Ohio at the time. Not sure if it is now, to be honest, but you used to have to hike 10 miles out into the bush if you wanted to get away with puffing on the devil's lettuce. So I had just sparked up a fat one, and I was enjoying the natural sights and sounds around me, when suddenly 
I heard something back in the woods from behind me. I turned around just in time to see a 15-foot figure swoop from behind one tree to another. I almost messed myself at first, but after a moment, I thought that maybe my eyes were just playing tricks on me. I studied the spot where I'd last seen the thing for a second before turning back towards the creek. Whoop. I heard that thing again, almost like a high-pitched whooping whistle sound. I turned around, and I saw it. A very tall and slender creature, almost bouncing from one tree to another, making that high-pitched whooping sound as it did. I've seen pictures of Sasquatch, but this, it was totally different. Like a tall, thin, boneless creature. Not like Slenderman either, but almost like a 20-foot puppet wearing a long, dark dress that made it look like one of those wavy car lot things. Of course, without any of the air blowing through it. I totally freaked out. This thing had completely killed my vibe. I ran out of the woods as fast as I could, and I never saw anything like it again. I will just say this. If you're in the Ohio backwoods, you'd better watch out. It Weeps at Twilight From Lord Slasher The process of losing someone close to you is often like losing a piece of yourself. One moment you can spend all the time in the world with them, and the next, you have a million words to say, but no one to say them to. It's as if they take all your joy and warmth with them, leaving you to wander the earth as a cold, barren husk. And it's in this aimless drift that, occasionally, you allow your mind to play with the idea of joining them in death, so you might be reunited with the person you held dear. My older brother and I were two of a kind, a pair of despondent souls who found meaning in each other's company. In our childhood, we were inseparable, so much so that we often could never stand to be apart for long. I recall we couldn't even be in separate classes during elementary school, lest we bombard our mother and father with protests. My parents owned a large sum of land in Washington State, which included a swath of forest right behind our house. Every day without fail, my brother and I made a long and arduous journey into the woods and would spend hours playing together. We'd pretend to be knights, building castles out of sticks strewn about the forest floor, laying siege to one another's fortresses. Looking back now, these are my fondest memories of my sibling and I. As we reached our teenage years, we became distant. My brother allocated the majority of his free time to his frequent girlfriends, and I dedicated myself to academics and a job. We began to talk to each other less and less, and the less we spoke, the greater the divide between us became. It was obvious we both understood what was happening, but we chose to ignore the problem, a decision I regret to this very day. During the final weeks of my junior year in high school, the many tests and exams inundating me had swept aside all other aspects of my life, including my relationships. While I did have friends, they, like me, were heavily involved in their studies, and being the terrible time manager I was, I could never spare even a minute from my preparation for finals to socialize. That was until my brother offered me the chance to attend a graduation party, being held by an acquaintance of his. Under normal circumstances, it was seniors only. However, he was willing to make an exception for me. Usually, I would have turned him down, but after weighing my options, I agreed. This must have surprised him a bit, as my brother nearly jumped in shock. Wow, bud, finally gonna try your luck with the ladies, he said, his voice still wavering with astonishment. I briefly guffawed at his comment before replying, No, I'll just keep you out of trouble. I'll leave the swooning to you. Be sure to clear your evening, he ordered, now grinning ear to ear, before promptly abandoning me to my solitude. As unappealing as the idea of spending my Saturday night around a group of drunken teenagers was, I refused to pass up the chance to impress my brother, 
and rekindle the blood bond that had fizzled out so long ago. The remainder of the week practically flew by, and I burned most of my spare time chipping away at any homework I still had. As I woke up Saturday morning, I was greeted with my brother's goofy smile. I had slept past my alarm, and far be it from my brother not to take the opportunity to give me a rude awakening. Wakey wakey, sleepyhead. It's eleven. I want to make sure my favorite little bro is ready for the night out, he said, patting my head. My glazed over eyes met his, and I could only mutter a brief retort. I hate you, man, so much. He chuckled and paraded out of my room, utterly proud of his achievement. The scent of bacon and eggs accosted my nose as I got dressed and headed down to the kitchen to eat. My mother was stationed by the stove and greeted me as I walked by. I returned the courtesy before taking my seat at the kitchen table. When she finished cooking, my mother switched off the stove and set down the plates. What's the occasion? I asked. She smiled. It's been a while since you two have spent some time together. Thought I'd commemorate the occasion. I looked down at my plate in guilt. Well, Mom, things get... Well, they get busy, you know. I can't balance it all. School, work, and all that. The important thing is, she said, that you're making an effort now. As the morning turned to afternoon, and afternoon to evening, I began to have second thoughts about attending the party. I was convinced my brother would simply forget about me once we arrived, leaving his dead-weight little brother in a sea of inebriated young adults. But I pushed the thoughts to the side, choosing to have faith in him. I dressed in a greaser-esque fashion, throwing on denim jeans, a leather jacket, and a muscle tee underneath. I snatched up my car keys and ventured to collect my brother. When he saw me, he looked a bit proud, I think. My little dweeb of a brother, all grown up now. I'm telling you, dude, if you just give it a shot, the ladies will be chasing you. I smirked, ushering him out the door. No time for complimenting me. Even if I am the superior sibling, we gotta get going. It was an unusually chilling May night. As we exited the house, the frigid air slammed into us like a freight train. I opened up the garage, and we shuffled into my old 79 Camaro. Like I said, I spent my entire high school career working on the side, and I'm proud of what I was able to save up for. The trip to the residence was surprisingly lengthy, taking us down multiple back roads, and about two-thirds of the way there, the pavement turned to dirt. We pulled into our destination at around 7 p.m. Amazingly, we were the first to arrive. My brother's friend, Howard, welcomed us inside, offering us food and drinks. It was 1985, and the laws against teenage alcoholism were not as harshly enforced those days, at least not where I lived. Within the hour, a sizable crowd had accumulated in Howard's yard. My brother and I assisted him in setting up the grill. Someone had even brought a boombox to the party and was blasting the song Metal Health by Quiet Riot at maximum volume. As the party picked up pace, I was pleasantly surprised by how much I was enjoying myself. I had entirely expected the experience to be a chore, but it was quite the opposite. I played a couple games of blackjack with some of the attendees and even served as a referee for a drinking contest involving my brother, which he admittedly lost. By 12, the party had begun to die out, with many guests starting to take their leave. I had abstained from alcohol for the duration of the party. In contrast, my brother overindulged and was having trouble speaking coherently. As the last of the attendees disappeared down the dark road, leading away from Howard's abode, I started to help Howard clean up the mess left in the party's wake. In the meantime, my brother lay splayed out on a sofa, clutching his head. Once we deemed the place immaculate, I helped my brother to his feet, and we prepared to head out. But Howard stopped me. You know, just because the party itself is over doesn't mean the fun has to be. There's this uh, deserted family estate just down the road from here. A lot of people say it's haunted. Want to go check it out? I hesitated. 
Given my brother's intoxication, it likely would not be a great idea to venture out into the woods to some decrepit old mansion. Just as I was ready to reply, I was cut off by said brother, who quickly took Howard up on his offer. Sure, man, even if it's haunted, it wouldn't stop me from going. He slurred. I glared at him, incredulity written across his face. It's late as it is, and we have a curfew. Ma's gonna kill us if we go, I vehemently objected. My brother turned to me, raising his eyebrow. I've already had a couple drinks, not like I can do much worse. I sighed, defeated. I knew I couldn't change his mind, but I also couldn't allow my brother and Howard to go alone. I gave in, and so the three of us charged forth into the icy night again, piling into my car. I had the unfortunate disposition of being transportation, appointed by Howard after he explained that his vehicle's transmission had failed recently. Howard directed me to the supposedly haunted property as we sped down winding, sparsely populated, wooded back roads. The closer we got to our destination, the more I noticed the streetlights and scarce forestry began to morph into dense, undisturbed woods. Eventually, we halted in front of an enormous pair of rusted iron gates decorated with vegetation. From what I could tell, there had at one point been a pair of initials welded into the gates, but they had since been removed. We carefully exited the vehicle, perhaps intimidated by the looming barriers. Howard glanced at me and my brother, a hint of mischief in his expression. You ready to see some ghosts, guys? I shrugged, unconvinced. Throughout my life at that point, I had never been very religious or spiritual. I plainly reasoned that you just ceased to exist when you died, and I didn't have any intention of changing my mind. Now that we stood in the presence of this manor, my brother seemed to have sobered up a bit. His stance shifted from relaxed to uneasy. Uh, yeah, I think so, he replied shakily. Howard shoved open the gates, which emitted an audible creaking sound that made my skin crawl. He proceeded to gesture for us to take the lead. How chivalrous of you to make us monster bait, I snarkily stated, trudging my way through the overgrown grass, my brother following suit. The task of plowing through the excessive undergrowth guarding the estate, considering how many thorn bushes had inconveniently decided to plant themselves in our path, was rather difficult. In due time, the dark shape of the house began to materialize in front of us. For all intents and purposes, the place looked very similar to its description. Much of the siding and roofing had partially or entirely been rotted away, exposing some of the framework. And where windows had once been, there were now only gaping holes. There appeared to be a wooden deck connected to the entrance of the house, which lay astoundingly intact. We worked our way to it, and with each step I took, a primal sense of dread slowly crept up deep within me, urging me to turn back, lest I risk seeing something humans were never intended to lay eyes upon. I wish I had listened. As we neared the deck, Howard pushed past us. He strided over to the door and tried the knob, but it refused to budge. Dang it! Hang on, I'm going to kick this thing in, he exclaimed dramatically. He began to vigorously slam his foot on the door, and after three or four tries, it gave way, crashing into the shadowy interior of the house. I rolled my eyes, angered by his lack of discretion, but I dared not oppose him at the moment. Now certainly wasn't the time to argue. Howard was the first to saunter on inside, accompanied by my brother, who was unusually quiet. I tread carefully, trying to muffle the sounds of my footsteps while I pursued them. As the pitch black enveloped me, I reached for my pocket and produced my handheld flashlight. When I switched it on, my jaw dropped. The entire interior of the house was spotless. In here, there were no signs of decay. Not a single speck of dust coated it. It was like the family never left. 
what the... I stuttered, before looking to my accomplices, seeing that they had similar reactions. My brother at last spoke up. Okay, so this place is missing windows, but somehow the furniture and floors are untouched? Am I dreaming? Howard and I must have been too stunned to reply. Both of us remained speechless. As a requited hush fell over the three of us, we began to become aware of a distinct noise emanating from the second story. The sound of intense sobbing. My eyes were the size of baseballs. I glanced at Howard and my brother, panic visible in their faces. Howard spoke in a whisper. We've got to check it out. Someone could be hurt in here. My eyes grew even wider. Are you kidding? Who would be crying like that at the dead of night in the middle of nowhere? Howard didn't respond. Instead, he began edging toward the staircase leading up to the second floor. Left with no other option, and being the self-proclaimed alpha males that we were, my brother and I, of course, stumbled after him. As we trampled up the stairs, my sense of trepidation grew ever stronger until it was drowning out all logical thought in my mind. We reached the top of the staircase and were presented with an extensive hallway on both sides. We promptly changed our course, while the distressing noise emanated from an unseen room to the right. Howard led the way. My increasing terror climaxed when I realized the noise was coming from the very end of the hallway. If it became necessary to run, our escape would be significantly prolonged. I shone my light down the hall to get a visual on the source, finding that the door to the room was shut. Seeing this as an opportunity, I shook Howard's shoulder in a final effort to convince him this wasn't a good idea. He once again soundly ignored me. Without wasting a word, Howard advanced toward the door as the crying became deafening. In one swift motion, he twisted the knob with a click that made my heart stop. The door swung open, and all at once the sobbing ceased. The only thing I heard was a faint ringing in my ears. My hands violently trembled as I raised my light to the now gaping doorway. What I saw will forever be burned into my memory, my very being. Inside the room, in a fetal position, there was a figure. It was slender, its colorless flesh lightly stretched across heavy bones. The proportions of this person were not human-like. No, this creature possessed arms extending well over half the length of its body, ending in sharp talons resembling overgrown fingernails. Long, greasy black hair was draped across its shoulders and back, lying in a mound around its unmoving form. Despite this, its spine was still visible, protruding from its backside like a disgusting series of cancerous lumps. My mind continuously tried and failed to process what my eyes were relaying to it. This must have been a nightmare, some malevolent fantasy generated by my subconscious. My body refused to move. I was frozen in place. Howard backed away from the door slowly, cautiously, but he made one fatal mistake. The pressure placed on the floorboard by his backpedaling released a nearly imperceptible sound, a creak. It was just loud enough. The creature perked up, its chest rising and falling rapidly. It began to gasp and seize. It was like watching a person trapped in a vacuum, left with no other choice but to painfully suffocate. It seemed to be writhing for a long time. All the while, me and my brother and Howard were helplessly forced to watch. At last, it ceased its convulsions as a new noise erupted from its unseen mouth. Laughter. It sounded like the demented, ragged giggling of a sickly woman, as if its lungs were filled to the brim with tar. And then, it moved. 
Its bones snapped and cracked as it rotated its neck to reveal its horrifying face. Even now, nearly 40 years later, I can still see it. The radiance of my flashlight reflected in its eyes, which were beady black marbles, soulless and piercing. It lacked a nose, possessing only slits that likely served as its nostrils, and its mouth, rather than a normal human maw. The creature's jaw was exposed by rotting flesh as it hung agape. It looked dislocated. Its mouth stretched ear to ear across its face, which was lined with rows of small needle-like teeth, dripping with what I can only assume was blood. This thing began to rise from its position on the floor to a towering height. I was by no means a small guy. I was six foot two and extremely athletic for my age, but the creature was even taller. As it stood, I began to realize the situation we were in. My brother was the first to act, shaking me out of my trance and shoving me down the hallway. He yelled out something, but the adrenaline coursing through my veins drowned out much of the sound I heard. I reached the end of the hall in record time. I dove down the flight of stairs. I went tumbling down, crashing onto the wooden tiles below. Instantly, I picked myself up and resumed sprinting to the doorway. I glanced behind me then to ensure that my brother and Howard were following me. Howard reached the doorway mere seconds after me and my brother was at the foot of the stairs. He shouted for me to go and run. I required no further instruction. I barreled into the foliage, completely unconcerned by the countless thorn bushes we had encountered earlier. Before long, the imposing iron gates appeared in my line of sight, and I shimmied through the tight opening. Howard was already plunging into the back seat of my car as I made a mad dash to the vehicle. I hurtled into the driver's side and shoved the key into the ignition. The car roared to life just as my brother slipped through the gates. He tore open the passenger side door and threw himself in, panting strenuously. I yanked the stick into reverse so hard it was liable to snap. As we pulled out, my headlights illuminated the thing. It sat perched atop the iron gates, its cavernous mouth still gleaming with crimson liquid. It made no attempt to pursue us further as we turned back onto the main road. I no doubt broke several traffic laws racing down those empty country roads that night. In our rigid silence, our only comfort was the soft hum of the engine. None of us was willing to speak up. But then again, none of us knew quite what to say. Loathing the notion of discussing what we'd all just witnessed, I switched on the radio, which began to play the song Everybody Wants to Rule the World by Tears for Fears. Eventually, the music appeared to relieve the unspoken tension between us. When we returned to Howard's home, he speedily and unceremoniously departed, vanishing into his house. Really, though, I only had harsh words to say to him. After all, he had been the one who insisted on examining the crying, and it was his idea to investigate the manor in the first place. Once my brother and I were left alone in the car... My brother ultimately shattered the hush that had befallen us. I, I... I think it's best we just pretend this never happened. He suggested, his voice quivering. Taking a moment to mull over the night's events, I solemnly agreed. Probably some... druggy or something, I replied, well aware that I was lying to him and myself. There are some things better left unsaid. Back at home, we were, of course, firmly reprimanded, a punishment well-deserved. But following that night, everything seemed to return to normal. My brother concluded a chapter of his life, graduating and obtaining his diploma. He then laid his sights on college. I completed my junior year with honors and started to consider my future career. However... As summer rolled around, I noticed a change in my brother. It began with him telling me about an ache he had throughout his body, as well as muscle spasms and nausea. 
My family initially assumed he had been suffering from occasional migraines, but his health only continued to decline. His activity decreased, and he gradually stopped going outside, or even getting out of bed. We were forced to admit him to a hospital in July, where, off to the side, the nurses admitted to us that when he was awake, he would tell them about a tall woman constantly tormenting him in his nightmares. The doctors could not give us a diagnosis for his condition. We were told that not much could be done for him, as physically, he was entirely healthy. During this time, I spent every moment I could at his side. He would pull through. He must pull through, I told myself. But fate intended differently. My brother's ailment became so critical, he was rarely ever aware or lucid. Nonetheless, in his final days, I was there, clasping his hand, tears streaming down my cheeks. I could do nothing but watch as the very life was strangled out of him, but I remained, still grasping his palm, long after his heart stopped. My family was devastated at his loss. I seldom left my room for days, maybe even weeks. When I returned to school, he never vacated my mind. How could I even begin to think about academics when he was gone? But something he had said resonated with me. The woman in his dreams. It was the creature we saw. It had to be. It had killed my brother. After I turned 18, on a hauntingly similar October morning, I convinced my father to allow me to borrow a hunting rifle of his, falsely telling him I was going hunting with friends. More determined than I'd ever been, I sprung into my vehicle and set off once more for the old abandoned family estate out in the woods. After a long drive, I at long last encroached on the property, sighting the familiar iron gates. I lingered in the car for a time, motionless, reflecting on how significantly this vile place had impacted my life. I loaded the rifle, and I stepped out of the vehicle. I thrust those gates open, and double-handing the rifle began my approach. Once I was a small distance away from the house, I lifted the rifle's muzzle to the sky, and I fired three rounds into the air in quick succession. I received no response. Furious, I called out. Still nothing. Fueled by rage, I stormed into the house. If I could not kill this creature, then I at least could reunite myself with my brother. As I entered, the interior was totally demolished. All the previously robust furniture and tiling now looked just as whittled and broken as the exterior. I recoiled in bewilderment, but I could not afford to pay it more mind than that. I scoured the entire structure, every room, every closet, every crevice. No space was left unchecked. But I found no creature. No tall woman. I exited the deteriorating home, defeated. Above, clouds had started to conceal the sun, and a light rain began to fall. As the raindrops battered me, I could no longer contain myself. Tears welled up in my eyes, and I collapsed to my knees. I wanted to tell my brother I was sorry that I had failed to make things right. But there I rested in a field of silence. Hunted Hunter from Ozark Hunter This is a story about what I encountered while hunting in the Ozarks of Missouri. The story takes place four years ago, during the rifle season of 2019. At the time, I was 20 years old, about to turn 21. As a birthday present, my dad decided to go hunting with me. I was pleased by this because he's always busy, and I don't get to talk with him as much as I want to. 
So I spent the week before opening day preparing, and I went to bed eagerly. That morning, though, I got a call from my mom. Hey, daughter. I'm using daughter to not reveal my actual name. Sorry, but your dad has just come down sick. He said he's not going to make it to the hunting trip. Naturally, I was upset by this. Even so, I got ready to go hunting after hanging up. I mean, after all, I'd spent all week preparing. It would be a waste not to go. So I got ready, grabbed my rifle, and hopped in my pickup. When I got set up in my stand, it was pitch black out still, and I decided to close my eyes for a bit. For those non-hunters listening, you want to try to get out to your stand while it's still dark, when the deer are still hunkered down. That way you're not scaring them away. I was sitting in the stand with my eyes closed when I started to hear footsteps. I was confused by these steps. They sounded bipedal as well as really heavy and unnatural. I've lived in the Ozarks my whole life and my parents often joked about me acting more like a boy as a child. I was constantly in the woods getting dirty, so I felt like I had the right to call myself a knowledgeable person about these woods. This wasn't normal. Suddenly, my dad's voice rang out from the darkness. Daughter, I've come to hunt with you. Where are you? This confused me. My dad is a joking, carefree guy. He wouldn't have just called out. He's the type to sneak up on you, grab you by the foot suddenly. And he knows where the deer stand is. He wouldn't be asking where I was. We haven't changed its location even once, because this spot never fails to provide does and bucks to shoot at. And on top of all of that, the voice was wrong. It was emotionless and monotone. It sounded more like a recording instead of actually coming from him. So I sat motionless, eyes wide open, looking around the dark forest, trying to see anything. But I had a very bad feeling. I might know what it was. I've heard these stories before. Stories about wendigos and skinwalkers and other things. Things that are able to mimic people's voices, including your loved ones. My heart began to pound as I silently started to panic. I was trapped here. If I was discovered, I wouldn't be able to outrun this thing, and my rifle started to feel useless. Then, I stifled a gasp as I saw a shadowy humanoid figure appear from the dark. I couldn't make out any features, except unnaturally long arms that brushed against the ground as it took heavy steps in the dry, fallen leaves of autumn. It looked around and walked past my stand, repeating the same thing over and over. Daughter, I've come to hunt with you. Can you tell me where you are? I stayed in my tree stand long after that thing had passed. I waited until the sun came up to get back to my truck. While I walked through the forest, I felt as if I was being watched, and I kept hearing sticks and branches breaking. It felt like hours before I finally made it back to my truck. I got in and quickly started it up. I looked into the rearview mirror, and now I have a memory burned into my mind from that one look. There stood a tall, pale figure leaning out from behind a tree, watching me leave before letting out what sounded like an angry, unnatural scream. I then let go of the steering wheel and covered my ears instinctively, before quickly grabbing it and jerking it to the right as I was about to hit a tree. My heart pounded in my chest. I drove back home where I slowly recounted the events in my mind. This hasn't changed my love for the woods, and I still hunt that area to this day. I've never experienced this again, though, and my dad did end up having COVID but pulled through. Then the two of us went hunting together, the year after. This is the first time I've shared this story, as my parents have always just laughed whenever I've discussed cryptic topics. So as I write this, I feel like I'm taking a heavy weight off my shoulders. I'll say this, no matter how well you think you know your woods or your hunting area, just know there are things out there that can make you rethink your entire thoughts about the woods you're familiar with. 
Hoboken Mountain, from Mountain Mike. Nestled in the uncharted depths of Tennessee's rugged mountains, my home is a realm of secrets unknown to many. Vast hills, imposing cliffs, and seemingly endless hollows stretch far beyond state borders, concealing a rich tapestry of history unbeknownst to most outsiders. The story I share delves into one such concealed narrative. In this remote expanse, there exists a section of forest-blanketed mountains known to the locals as Hoboken Mountain. Yet, to the natives entrenched in the region, they refer to it as the forest that takes. This place is shrouded in mystique, echoing a tale that transcends mere names and taps into a hidden history veiled beneath the shadows of ancient hills and cliffs that seem to stretch into eternity. Long ago, colonists ventured deeper into unexplored territories, their aspirations fixated on the coveted expanse, now currently known as Hoboken Mountain. Extensive surveys of the region unveiled a panorama of allure, a wealth of animals, abundant resources, and fertile grounds promising bountiful harvests. This mountainous haven not only satisfied their immediate needs, but strategically positioned, became a linchpin for further settlements. The colonists, driven by dreams of prosperity, saw in Hoboken Mountain not merely a plot of land, but a key to unlocking the untold potential of their burgeoning community. During this era, the indigenous people and the newly arrived colonists existed in a state of mutual coexistence. However, as news spread of the colonists' intentions to settle in the foothills of Hoboken Mountain, a shift in the delicate cohabitation occurred. The native inhabitants, rather than adopting a hostile stance, chose a path of caution and concern. Sensing an impending disturbance, they earnestly warned the newcomers to steer clear of that particular terrain, their voices carrying a wisdom rooted in a fear and superstition for the darkness that lingered in Hoboken Mountain. Unfazed by warnings and superstitions, the resolute colonists, driven by prospects, forged ahead with their settlement construction. Occasional skirmishes with native groups and sabotage, motivated by fear of the ominous consequences of trespassing on the cursed ground, failed to impede their progress. Undeterred, the settlers successfully constructed their settlement, laying the foundation for the founding of a town. Numerous tales shroud the generations during which this settlement endured, none of them positive and all lacking any corroborating evidence. The lore weaves a dense narrative of misfortune, otherworldly affliction, and mysterious disappearances. Depending on the storyteller, the consensus emerges that the settlement was ultimately abandoned, surrendered to the relentless embrace of the encroaching forest. Presently, locals caution against venturing near those woods. While not everyone heeds the warning, any seasoned hunter understands the unspoken wisdom. Avoid those woods, and if you go, do so in a group. The unwritten rule for Hoboken Mountain is clear. Never defy the rule of two. Always ensure you're in a pair or more, never fewer. In the summer of 97, I foolishly defied the cardinal rule. While the Amazon is dubbed the Green Inferno, those acquainted with the Tennessee mountains in summer would argue it's the true Green Inferno. An expansive realm of mountains and trees, once inside, the sky vanishes and orientation fades. Raised in these woods, I'd hunted them for years, familiar with the Hoboken mountain range. However, that summer marked my first solo expedition. Originally planned with three fellow hunters, unforeseen circumstances left me alone. Ignoring better judgment and swayed by a misplaced confidence, I ventured into the woods alone. Driving my truck down the dirt road leading to the Hoboken forest entry, I left it at the road's end, commencing my track. Standing at the precipice where dirt met treeline, the forest seemed to hold its breath in anticipation as I crossed the threshold into the woods. Embarking on the track to a familiar hunting spot, a location of past success, required a two-hour hike. Initially, the forest teemed with life, birds, bugs, squirrels, the vibrant symphony of nature. However, 
as I delved deeper, an unsettling unease settled in. Despite knowing the terrain well, I felt an unnatural disconnect with my surroundings. The cliché sensation of being watched manifested profoundly on this hike. With about 30 minutes remaining, I decided to pause, settling on a rock for a sip of coffee from my thermos. I glanced down and discovered several drops of blood on a leaf. Realization struck as I recognized the source, a cut on my arm. The scene took an eerie turn as a flock of butterflies gracefully descended, landing on the leaf and engaging in a bizarre struggle over prodding the blood droplets with their proboscis. Lost in a surreal trance, I gazed at the bizarre butterflies. A sudden snap jolted me, but as I turned, there was nothing. When I looked back, both the butterflies and the blood droplets had vanished. Shrugging off the ominous feeling, I pressed on with my hike, reaching the spot where we had set up a deer stand years earlier. Upon entering, I found myself overlooking a picturesque clearing, cut through by a stream flowing down from the mountain. The scene was enchanting, a perfect spot to patiently await a deer. Within an hour, a massive buck emerged into the clearing. Slowly raising my rifle and peering through the scope, I had him in my crosshairs when he abruptly jerked his head towards the tree line. Something had spooked him and he bolted before I could take the shot. Swinging my scope towards the disturbance, I observed movement in the bushes, a pinkish blur that gradually revealed itself. What emerged was beyond horror. My heart and lungs seemed to halt in fear. In the clearing stood a naked, dirt-covered duplicate of… myself, staring directly up at me with a malevolent gaping smile of rotted blackened teeth. Lowering my gun, I aimed to scrutinize the naked figure of myself with my own eyes, without the distance of the scope potentially distorting my observation. However, in the brief span it took for me to lower the scope and my eyes to adjust, it simply vanished. Disturbed and disoriented, I sat frozen. The forest, once filled with the lively chorus of nature, now felt oppressive and eerily silent. The unsettling encounter left me grappling my own sanity. I cautiously descended into the clearing, with rifle in hand, where the bizarre apparition had stood. The air seemed charged with an otherworldly energy. Every hair on my body stood on end, a primal fear enveloping me. I felt hunted, akin to the buck. Suddenly, a human-like guttural roar echoed from beyond the tree line. Without hesitation, I turned and sprinted. The dense forest once familiar, now felt like an ominous labyrinth closing in on me as I covered the two-hour hike in nearly half the time. Gasping for breath, I emerged from the trees onto the dirt road, hands planted on my truck's hood as if seeking refuge in a twisted game of tag. In my peripheral vision, a massive black form shifted behind a tree in the direction I'd exited the woods. Glancing back, I saw a single hand grotesquely human in form, clung to the bark before vanishing behind the tree. I hastily climbed into my truck, leaving a trail of dust in my wake, putting Hoboken Mountain in my rearview mirror. The encounter was unlike anything I've ever faced before or since that day. While I struggle to fully comprehend or accept what happened, I'll share this insight. The world harbors ancient mysteries even still in modern times, and in those aged corners, relics of a long-forgotten world may stir and come to life. Beware of old places with old tales, for those stories may linger on, very much alive. Thanks for stopping by our little campsite here at Outdoor Terrors. To hear your story on the show, send it to us at darkstories.org. For more scary stories from me, catch me on my other podcasts, Unexplained Encounters, and Tales from the Break Room on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. Or go to eeriecast.com for those and even more terrifying podcasts. Follow me on X or Twitter at Dark Prevails. And if you don't mind, leave a rating for Outdoor Terrors on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Till next time, I'll see you soon when the campfire blazes once again.